Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our next presentation. My name is David Farrick, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Cell Analysis at Agilent, and I'll be your host for this presentation. Uh, I hope you've all been enjoying the presentations and virtual events uh, of our first 24-hour ever uh, digital event focused on immunology and cancer biology. We're really excited, and we already know that a number of you have seen great presentations from people like Ping Chi Ho and uh, Christopher Dorenzo, Laura Kampa, Hong Bo Chi, and a number of others, and I'm just really um, excited to be able to uh, uh, share those with you. Uh, this next speaker, I actually have the privilege uh, for the next talk, um, which is entitled Linking Cancer Metabolism to, to Neurodegeneration, uh, by none other than Dr. Navdeep Shandel, who is the, the David W. Kugel uh, professor of Medicine and Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics at Northwestern. Uh, NAV uh, has been a leader in the field of mitochondria for, for many, many years. Uh, what I believe has separated his work um, from many of what we call mitochondriacs, those uh, individuals that are uniquely focused on this amazing organ now, is really the ability to connect it to biology through signaling uh, and really give it um, a presence in the world of biology and disease investigation, uh, and really uniquely through the lens of the mitochondria itself, making it much, much more than a biochemical wonder. Uh, so I'm really just excited to have, have here today, and in fact, sharing uh, a new uh, perspective uh, with neurodegeneration and all that we've learned in cancer metabolism. So before I hand it over to Nav, uh, just a couple of uh, quick housekeeping notes. There is a Q&A uh, uh, period immediately following Nav's talk. And to help us get to as many of your questions as possible, we encourage that you type in your questions during the presentation so that we can f facilitate that process better. And with that, Naf, uh, take it away. And thank you for attending. Great, David. Um, I'm delighted to be here. And thank you again for the kind invite. Um, I'm excited to tell you some of our ongoing work in cancer metabolism and how it links to neurodegeneration. And so uh, just to... Uh, orient everybody. I let me see if I can make sure I get my slides up. Uh, here's my disclosure slide, and so uh, I always show this slide um, because it reminds everybody of what the textbooks tell you uh, about what mitochondria functionally do. And the key here is their function, right? And um, if you read any biochemistry book or a cheap plug here, you can buy my own book, Navigating Metabolism. Um, we know that mitochondria generate ATP, right? The process of oxidative phosphorylation. Now, equally important is the recognition that the great biochemists uh, discovered in the, in the 20th century that uh, mitochondria also generate these metabolites. And these metabolites are essentially sort of the building blocks for growth, right? So you can just go back to your biochemistry books. And for example, citrate is the backbone for lipogenesis or oxaloacetate eventually can funnel into aspartate for nucleotide synthesis. Succinyl-CoA is sort of a building block for heme. So the canonical functions of mitochondria tend to be its role in bioenergetics, uh, and uh, as well as biosynthetic organelles. And this has been widely appreciated now for many decades. Uh, one of the excitements in the field, I would say in really in the last 25 years, and this is where largely our work uh, has contributed to, is what I call the third essential function of mitochondria, which is their role as signaling organelles. So in other words, mitochondria are responding to uh, environmental inputs or changes in the cytoplasm. And uh, by responding to either changes in nutrients or oncogenes, uh, they themselves release signaling molecules. And these signaling molecules then can make pivotal decisions in the cell um, biology. So uh, we were inspired by uh, Zha Dong Wang's spectacular finding that mitochondria release cytochrome C to make a decision for cell death by activating caspases. And uh, uh, we followed this work in the late 90s, by uh, mid to late 90s, by discovering that H2O2 can be released by mitochondria for the activation of HIF-dependent gene expression. Recently, our work has uh, led to the appreciation that TCA cycle metabolized through changes in chromatin modification or DNA methylation can impact cell fate or function. Obviously, there's quite a bit of work uh, and excitement around mitochondrial DNA being released to um, uh, uh, modulate inflammation, as well as, you know, ATP still matters. So if mitochondria have changes in ATP uh, concentrations, then you can activate AMPK, and that will actually... Uh, 
shut down anabolic functions in the cell and change to a, a catabolic program. And so these are just give you some ideas about how mitochondria are signaling. Now, these are not the only ways. I think there are more and more uh, things being discovered almost weekly um, and how mitochondria are signaling. And I think this is a quite an exciting area, especially for the younger generation to sort of get into. There are a lot to be discovered here. I'll just give you two salient examples of mitochondrial signaling. One comes from some of our work in HIF. As many of you know, uh, the regulation of hypoxia-inducible factor uh, was uh, given the Nobel Prize this past year. And we know under normoxia, this uh, protein is hydroxylated by proyl hydroxylases, the PhDs. And that hydroxylation is recognized by uh, uh, the PVHL protein, which brings in this E3 ligase activity and degrades HIF, uh, HIF alpha subunit. But mitochondria can release hydrogen peroxide as well as TCA cycle metabolites that will prevent that hydroxylation. And under hypoxia, this will then uh, cause stabilization of the HIF alpha subunit, which they can then bind to HIF1 beta and turn on a, vo a variety of genes involved in erythropoiesis, angiogenesis, tumor evasion, metabolism genes, uh, as well as the immune response. A second idea that we like to work on is uh, how TCA cycle metabolites change the epigenetic landscape. You know, as the, in the last 25 years, the epigenetic communities discovered many enzymes that control chromatin modification or DNA methylation or demethylation. There's been an appreciation that many of these enzymes use uh, metabolic substrates from the TCA cycle. So, for example, a histone acetylation, you need an acetyl co-group, and in part, that acetyl co-group comes from citrate. So citrate can exit the mitochondria where ATP citrate lies, will uh, generate acetyl CoA, and that'll, that'll be used for histone acetylation. Many of the demethylase reactions, so both for RNA, DNA, and histones, are alpha ketoglutarate dependent uh, family members. And if you have more succinate fulmerate or L2-hydroxyglutarate, and we'll talk about this later, compared to alpha-ketoglutarate, then uh, you can inhibit those demethylases and you'll get a hypermethylation of histones, DNA, as well as RNA. And so you can see how mitochondria early in evolution uh, were communicating potentially through these metabolites uh, to change gene expression and uh, cell fate and function. So my lab is interested in four areas. We've done a lot of work in the cancer arena, which I'll talk about, and I'll show you how our, that's led to our recent appreciation in neurodegeneration. Uh, another theme has been aging, uh, because again, mitochondria are quite related to the, um, aging, as well as uh, inflammation, and you probably have heard already from other speakers about how metabolism can control immune function. I, I won't touch upon some of that data today, just briefly mention it, but I really want to talk about our most recent story that recently got published on cancer and then a new story on how it's linked to neurodegeneration. So we got into the field of cancer metabolism almost about 13, 14 years ago now, when a talented uh, graduate student, uh, Frank Weinberg, uh, insisted that we work on cancer metabolism, but in vivo. And I said, well, you know, there's a simple experiment we could do to test the role, the necessity of the electron transport chain uh, for tumor growth. And uh, that's, we can take advantage of a protein called TFAM, which is necessary for mitochondrial DNA and replication. So if you lose TFAM, mitochondrial DNA is lost, and a whole bunch of uh, complexes sort of fall apart. Because remember, the mitochondrial DNA encodes for a few subunits of these critical electron transport chain subunits. And so no TFAM, no electron transport. It's almost a hammer experiment. And now your cancer cells are purely glycolytic, right? right? So these are highly glycolytic tumors. And we asked whether in vivo, whether you get a bigger tumor or a smaller tumor. And what Frank did was he crossed our TFAM floxed mice to uh, uh, the KRAS oncogenic uh, mice. And basically these what you can do is you can add Cree down the lungs of the mice and activate conditionally oncogenic KRAS G G12D. And at the same time, you can flux out the TFAM gene. So wherever the KRAS gene is activated, you lose TFAM. And you can ask a couple of weeks later, 10 weeks later, 12 weeks later, whether the tumor burden is less, less the same 
are much bigger. So remember, they are purely glycolytic, and many people would have predicted because these are now sort of classic Warburg-like cells. In other words, as showing high rates of aerobic glycolysis, that maybe you would get bigger tumors. In fact, we got much smaller tumors. So again, this is in a system where you have an intact immune system. It's in the right location in the lung, and it's being driven by a known oncogene that drives lung adenocarcinoma. And I think Many uh, laboratories have uh, repeated uh, a, ver a version of this sort of experiment in the past 10, 12 years, have come to the same conclusion that in vivo, if you knock out uh, the respiratory chain, pharmacologically or genetically, you have less tumors, not typically bigger tumors. So uh, recently, a couple of years ago, uh, Inma Martinez-Reyes, uh, talented postdoc who left the lab recently, uh, was interested in asking, so what's so special about the electron transport chain? Like, why do you need it for tumor growth? So what metabolic requirements are linked to the mitochondrial respiratory chain for tumor growth? Uh, and so the system that she chose to work on is uh, looking at tumor cells that where she can make them deficient in electron transport chain complex three. So here it's highlighted in blue. And the idea was we'll just knock out electron transport chain uh, by knocking out now, not the whole chain, but specifically mitochondrial complex three. And presumably they'll make less tumors. And then we can try to go back and do simple add back experiments. And you'll see what I mean in a second uh, and to figure out what about uh, the electron transport chain is necessary. So we needed to sort of do this in a few models and I'll show you these models in a second. So one of the models we did is uh, a, a notch-driven, oncogenic notch-driven leukemic model. So in this model, basically, what we're doing is we're taking hematopoietic stem cells and uh, we uh, make them leukemic by giving notch, uh, and we give them to bone marrow, uh, uh, irradiated bone marrows. Uh, and then after we let the the tumor cells in graft and start to grow a little bit. And then we give them tamoxifen. What the tamoxifen allows us to do is to knock out complex three subunit called QPC. It's one of the, uh, the key subunits of complex three. So you knock out QPC uh, in these leukemic cells. Uh, you lose electron transport chain function. You lose mitochondrial complex three. And in the spleen and the bone marrow, you have a lot less cells. It's quite dramatic, right? And this was sort of expected, but it was nice. Again, this is a real bona fide tumor genesis model uh, that shows that it, indeed complex three is essential for tumor progression. We can take uh, KRAS G12D uh, oncogenic transformed uh, lung adenocarcinoma cells, which also harbor uh, loss of P53. Again, these are the two main drivers uh, of uh, many lung adenocarcinomas. Again, we can by CRISPR knockout, in this case, complex three. Uh, and again, you get markedly less tumors uh, and the mice uh, survive. Uh, and so again, just another model. And finally, sort of a workhorse cell line is a human osteosarcoma cell line. And so this is a human cell line which harbors a mutation in this, and again, an essential subunit of complex three called cytochrome B. And in vitro, these cells can grow because, and we've used them for years, we give them lots of high glucose, glutamine, pyruvate, uridine, uh, we give it a lot of stuff, and they do fine in vitro, but in vivo, clearly, they don't make any tumors. So now we have almost three different models. Uh, and this is consistent with uh, a lot of our other work. If you inhibit the electron transport, uh, in this case, we're doing it genetically by complex three, you barely get any tumors. So the question is why? What's so special? And so going back to complex three, uh, yeah, and here's a simple schematic, uh, we wanted to know is there something special about complex three? So we know, what does complex three really do? Well, it proton pumps. The proton pumping is um, contributes to ATP generation, right? So this is oxidative phosphorylation. But the other thing that it really does is it takes electrons from ubiquinol. So just to remind you of the biochemistry, there's upstream complexes, complex one and two. Remember, complex one regenerates NAD, complex two regenerates FAD. Those regeneration of NAD and FAD allows the TCA cycle to go round and round so it can generate all those metabolites for growth. Uh, a rate-limiting rate enzyme for primitive nucleotides is DHODH. Uh, interestingly, it's the only nucleotide enzyme that's stuck in the, uh, in the mitochondria. Uh, it also donates two electrons to ubiquinol. So complex one, two, and DHODH all donate two electrons to ubiquinone or Q. 
And by donating, getting those two electrons, ubiquinone becomes reduced to ubiquinol. And then ubiquinol passes its electrons to complex three and in turn regenerates to become uh, Q again, ubiquinol. And by regenerating Q, you can now dump in two more electrons from these upstream complexes. So really a major role of complex three is to continue to recycle electrons so you can continue to have the upstream complexes function. So we ask, is, is there something special about this, this taking electrons from Q or is it something about proton pumping? And, and uh, this is where I think, uh, you know, here's a, a plug for Seahorse and Agilent. Um, this is where doing a simple seahorse assay is really beneficial because we know complex three knockout cells don't respire, right? So if you want to do any manipulations back, uh, you want to at least know what the respiratory chain is doing. And one of its function is obviously respiration, oxygen consumption. And these cells, complex three knockouts, as predicted, they have uh, barely any oxygen consumption or coupled respiration. So now we do a, tr a genetic trick. We come back and we add back alternative oxidase. Alternative oxidase is, uh, is one of these enzymes found in plants and lower organisms, and this is from sea squirta, a bottom dweller right in the ocean, right? And, and uh, basically, AOX will take electrons from Q, just like complex three will do, but it'll donate it directly to oxygen as the final electron acceptor. Uh, what's uh, very important here is that AOX does not generate ATP, right? It doesn't proton pump in any way. So it doesn't contribute to ATP production. And so when you have the schematic, basically complex one proton pumps a little bit and it, it generates ATP through uh, that proton pumping of complex one. But the key thing is AOX allows for complex one, two, and DHODH to function. Now, if the main role of complex three was proton pumping, we wouldn't get the tumors back. But if it's simply to allow uh, complex one, two, or DHODH to work, then the tumor should come back. So again, this is where uh, doing a simple seahorse analysis happens, because if, you, if I just go back, uh, AOX should allow uh, electrons uh, it's from ubiquinol and donate them to oxygen and, and therefore AOX consumes oxygen. And indeed, that's what you can see with basal oxygen consumption and uh, you see a recovery of oxygen consumption. The other key thing is because, if I just go back, complex one ge generates uh, 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 proton pumps, uh, it allows for generation of ATP. And again, coupled OCAR is basically coupled respiration. So the amount of respiration is coupled to ATP generation, and that also comes back. And this is all being driven by complex one proton pumping. So you bring back ATP generation, you bring back oxygen consumption, uh, you bring back complex one, two, and DHOD function, and the tumors come back. Right. So it's, what it really tells you is there's nothing special about complex three in these tumor cells. It's just simply you can substitute another protein that'll take electrons from um, uh, ubiquinol and keep the upstream complexes working. Right. So that's sort of the take home message. So now that we have a system, this sort of mini uh, respiratory chain that we've uh, genetically engineered uh, where uh, we've gotten rid of complex three and put back AOX, we can ask, uh, well, are the upstream complexes important? So for example, we can ask whether complex two is necessary. So what we do here is basically take our cells, which have AOX in them and knock out complex two. Uh, and now these cells, those don't make tumors, right? We can do the same thing with DH or DH, and again, you'll find the same result. I'm not showing you, but I really want to harbor a little bit on complex one because it regenerates NAD, and a lot of people have been interested in NAD regeneration. So if we knock out complex one in the system, again, uh, you don't get tumors. So clearly complex one is necessary for tumor genesis. The real question was why, right? Uh, what, what's so special about complex one? Again, is it the proton pumping? Maybe, remember, in this, in this uh, system where we have complex three loss, we've put back AOX, complex one is regenerating NAD, but it's also contributing to the ATP production. So maybe it's the ATP that's dominant and not the NAD regeneration. So again, we can do reductionist experiments. We can get rid of complex one, so you get rid of 
tumor growth, but you've gotten rid of both NAD regeneration as well as proton pumping. And now in this system, we can add back enzymes that only regenerate NAD. Right, and these are these enzymes called LBNOX, uh, and you can put LBNOX, which will regenerate NAD. Again, they do not contribute to ATP, and we can put back the LBNOX, uh, which will regenerate NAD in the mitochondria or in the cytoplasm. And as you can see, it raises the, the total uh, cytoplasmic ratio of NAD to NADH. So these enzymes work really. Uh, magnificently. And so the real question was, what would happen to the tumors? That's right. And, and uh, what we got was basically that if we put the NAD regeneration back into the mitochondria, right? Uh, so what we do, what we're doing here is we're knock out complex one. So by knocking out complex one, NAD regeneration is gone, as is the ability to generate ATP. They're both gone. But if we just bring back NAD regeneration we, in the mitochondria, we bring back tumor growth, right? So these tumors that are growing in the LB Knox mito that you can see, those tumors, they're growing fine, right? They're, they grow as well as wild type tumors do, right? So in that system, all we've brought back is the NAD regeneration and not the ATP production. So because they have AOX, which doesn't generate ATP. So we have a system basically that generates no ATP from mitochondria. And yet, as long as they can regenerate NAD and complex three works, uh, AOX works, they grow fine. The cytoplasmic LBNOX also grows, but much, much, much less efficiently. And the question was why? What's, so, what's the big difference? Because they're both NAD regenerating, but they're doing them in different locations. One's doing it in the mitochondria and one's doing it in the cytoplasm. So here we did uh, carbon labeling, and what we did is we uh, followed the labeling of glutamine that you can see. A, and the key here is that glutamine and, um, will label alpha-ketoglutarate, and if it goes in the oxidative clockwise direction, then if you label with heavy carbon all five carbons, the citrate pool will be M plus four. If it goes back, it's called reductive carboxylation, you get a citrate pool of M plus five, right? And that's, uh, so one is the oxidative mode where you get M plus four. One is the reductive mode, which is not in an efficient way, but nevertheless, it can happen. It's not as thermodynamically favored, obviously, and, uh, and that's the reductive. And so when you look at the difference uh, of M plus four, you can see, which is the oxidative, the mitochondrial NAD in those cells, regeneration supports the TCA cycle going in its normal direction. And, and if you, sorry, if you look at the M plus five, it's the, either the wild type or the uh, cytoplasmic NAD regeneration enzyme, cyto, cyto LB NOx. So the, really the big difference between the mito LB NOx or the mito NAD regeneration and cyto NAD regeneration in the complex one knockouts is that the mitochondrial NAD regeneration allows for the TCA cycle to go round and round clockwise in the oxidative mode, while the other one and the cytoplasmic NAD regeneration allows as a reductive carboxylation to occur. And if that, if that can allow you to grow a bit, but clearly not very efficiently. And that's manifested here, again, in the, in the tumor growth. You can see they're just not very efficient using this reductive mode of growing. The, the canonical oxidative mode is, is uh, really the, the preferred choice here. And so uh, really uh, the take home message is for us is that you know, the, the major role of the electron transport chain is to keep complex one, two, and DHODH from functioning. And complex one and two functioning allows the TCA cycle to go round and round and it's natural oxidative clockwise. And this allows for rapid generation of all those metabolites uh, that I talked about in my first slide. It, uh, you know, aspartate for nucleotide synthesis or citrate for lipogenesis. It's, and uh, it's really the heart of it is a uh, ubiquinone taking multiple uh, as really an electron acceptor for uh, complex one, complex two, DH or DH. And of course, as, as it uh, ubiquinone takes all those electrons, it passes off to complex three so it can continually 
take those electrons and keep those upstream complexes working. And so um, I want to just, um, I didn't talk anything about glycolysis or the Warburg effect, which I think is universally appreciated by most people. Uh, I want to basically make one salient point as a take home. Uh, our data in no way says that the Warburg effect doesn't happen or isn't important. We, the way we like to think about it, and, and Ralph Deverdeen, as many of you know in the field, and I wrote a little commentary in Nature Metabolism recently about this, which is that, you know, if, if you just go back and think about what is a, a, a anabolic metabolism looks like, and this would apply for T cells as well, or any pro-growth uh, phenomenon, uh, again, um, both the glycolytic intermediates and the TCA cycle intermediates funnel into biosynthetic pathways, from lipogenic pathways to nucleotide pathways. And so the way we like to think is that the both set of metabolites, uh, the glycolytic metabolites as well as the TCA cycle metabolites, are necessary uh, for tumor growth. Uh, we don't think uh, either pathway is sufficient, but they're both necessary. And I think that's sort of the simple take-home uh, uh, message. And, of course, uh, one of the exciting things is trying to find uh, ways to um, target certain enzymes in these pathways uh, and combine it with chemotherapy or radiotherapy uh, uh, as well as immunotherapy and uh, see if there, uh, we can uh, find the metabolic therapies uh, for cancer therapy. So let me switch uh, gears um, in my second half here and talk about neurodegeneration. And, uh, you know, how do we get into this? Obviously, I'm not a neurobiologist. Um, and, and the way we got into it is, um, and I'll, I'll just uh, show you, it really came from our cancer metabolism work. So one of the other reasons we've, I've always been interested in uh, neurobiology is, and I once in a while get invited to a neuro meeting just to broadly talk about mitochondria, is that, you know, one of, if you ask uh, the neuro community as to you know, why any particular neurological disease is obviously one of the, the leading theories is uh, uh, proteotoxicity. So many of the neurological diseases have protein aberrations or protein misfolding. But the other mechanism people uh, talk about, and which is not mutually exclusive to the proteotoxicity idea that mitochondria are dysfunctional. Uh, and this and canonical explanations as to how mitochondrial dysfunction leads to neuro any neurological disease is too much ROS, right? Too much, too much reactive oxygen species, which clearly at high levels can damage, or just bioenergetics, right? I mean, the brain is a metabolically um, active organelle, and synaptic transmission is an ATP-demanding process, and uh, if, uh, you, you know, glycolysis is ATP is insufficient for neuronal health. So simple idea, too much ROS, too little ATP. And so I want to present a third idea, uh, which is uh, not mutually exclusive. It's the idea of metabolic toxicity. What if mitochondria, when they're dysfunctional, make a neurotoxic molecule. And I want to talk about one in particular that we're excited about. It's called L2-hydroxyglutarate, which might be linked to uh, neurological diseases. So how did we stumble upon L2-hydroxyglutarate? And so again, going back to our, uh, our tumor experiment, so remember I showed you this 14-3B cell line, which has a mutation in complex 3. So this mutation in complex three, uh, obviously these cells don't grow in vivo. But in vitro, as I pointed out, I and mean, we've been playing with these cells for now like 16, 17 years in the lab for a variety of reasons. And many graduate students and postdocs have used this as sort of our electron deficient tumor cell line to play around for a variety of reasons. I'm thankful to Carlos Moraes, who kindly uh, gave me the cell line. It's been a really a wonderful cell line. And, and we did a lot of experiments in vitro. In fact, one of the things we did was uh, team up with Ralph Deberdinas years ago and gave Ralph uh, the cell line. And uh, I think this is, uh, Ralph told me this was one of his first metabolite profiling experiments they did. And I think he likes the cell line because compared to the wild type, you know, you have a complex three deficiency. Uh, and if you're just setting up uh, a mass spec uh, 
uh, profiling, a metabolite profiling, you want sort of a robust system where you have an on-off switch almost. So you have wild type cells or you have complex three knockout. So you should see massive changes in metabolism, which, you know, if you're sort of trying to perfect your metabolite profiling, it, it would be a good use. And the top metabolite that was, uh, um, that was elevated in these complex three, obviously succinate, which is comes from complex two, but it was this two hydroxyglutarate, right? And and, uh, and we reported this in the cell reports paper. It didn't really make much off it. Uh, we didn't necessarily highlight it, but it's there in this paper. But uh, you know, it always stayed with me. And we were doing some other experiments. So, what is two hydroxyglutarate? I think most of you know about two hydroxyglutarate, and, and the lion's share of two hydroxyglutarate's attention comes from uh, uh, it's linked to these IDH mutations, sort of the darling of the cancer metabolism field for the last 15 years. And there's drugs against these mutations that IGOS has now, uh, and these are linked to AML, glioma, and other cancers. And just to remind you, so these. Um, mutations in IDH will make the D form of 2-hydroxyglutarate. But there's another form called the L form, um, or sometimes the S form as it's called. So, But L2-hydroxyglutarate is made when any DH levels are high, and it's not made by mutations in IDH, but they're actually made by um, malate dehydrogenase uh, or lactate dehydrogenase. There's an enzyme that can get rid of L2-AG uh, called the L2-H GDH, and they'll convert it back to alpha-ketoglutarate. And really, the L2-AG is the more widely, um, uh, you know, the more widely recognized metabolite throughout evolution. So E. coli can make L2-AG, um, plants can make it, the mammalian cells make it. Uh, you can always make it as long as you have uh, this uh, buildup of NADH. And uh, so let me... Um, um, show you a little bit of uh, the chemistry of these reactions. And really the take home is the D, the D form of 2-AG largely is made with IDH mutations. It can also be made other ways, but uh, the really the accumulation is due to the IDH mutations. And what I'm referring to today is the L form of it, the L2-HG. And this accumulates when NADH and NAD are increased. Of course, as you know, the NADH and NAD ratio would increase because Complex one wouldn't work, right? Because complex one regenerates NAD. And so, uh, and that's how we sort of started to link it because uh, complex one regenerates NAD. And so mitotic dysfunction is known to increase NADH levels and that would be predicted in some cases then to elevate L2 hydroxyglutarate. So malate dehydrogenase two typically takes malate as a substrate, but promiscuously it will use alpha-ketoglutarate only when NADH is around and generate L2-HG. L2-HG can be converted back to alpha-ketoglutarate in the mitochondria by a L2-HGDH. Uh, in the cytoplasm, malate dehydrogenase 1 or LDH will also convert alpha-ketoglutarate to uh, L2-HG. Acidic pH can make this reaction go. And the L2AG can sort of equilibrate uh, between the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. Um, but again, I've highlighted this in blue. It's really important to think that what's driving these reactions are really normal enzymes, malate dehydrogenase, lactate dehydrogenase, and normal metabolite alpha-ketoglutarate, but it's happening under conditions which are a bit abnormal when you have high levels of NADH due to mito dysfunction. One place naturally this would happen is when NADH accumulates in severe hypoxia, and hypoxia is known to increase L2-AG. We clearly found L2-AG markedly elevated in our mitochondrial complex 3 null cell line, our cytochrome B null cell line. Then the other reasons I'm excited about metabolites, you know, in a metabolite profiling, depending on your particular core, you know, at least they do 200, 250, some do 400 targeted metabolites. Uh, one of the challenges of all these metabolites is to think in the context of larger biology, like why is any of these metabolites interesting? Why is 2-hydroxyglutarate interesting? For us, 2-hydroxyglutarate is super interesting. Not only is it linked to high levels of NADH, which would happen when mitochondria are not functional, but also what they do. And what they do is they're potent inhibitors of alpha-ketoglutarate-dependent dioxygenases. 
is and these alpha cutic glutarodioxygenases include the proyl hydroxylases that control HIFs, as the TET enzymes that control DNA methylases, the RNA demethylases enzymes, the Jumanji domain histone demethylases, they're all inhibited by like succinate, but also by 2-hydroxyglutarate, both the LN and the D form, right? So when you have this accumulation of 2-hydroxyglutarate, the L form, compared to alpha-ketoglutarate, you'll see histones being hypermethylated, DNA being hypermethylated, RNA being hypermethylated, you'll see HIF being stabilized. And so that's quite exciting because all of those processes control cell function and uh, cell fate. And in fact, indeed, Elena Anso in the lab, she was interested in uh, studying hematopoietic stem cells. And uh, as you know, hematopoietic stem cells have to self-renew, but they also differentiate into multipotent progenitors and if mitochondria are dysfunctional, if you lose complex three in stem cells, and we could do this genetically in vivo with all the genetic tricks, uh, what Elena noticed was that there's a lot of L2-hydroxy accumulation in these stem cells, and this prevents their differentiation into multipotent progenitors. Uh, Sam Weinberg uh, last year reported that the regulatory T cells, so again, if you knock out complex three specifically in regulatory T cells, Remarkably, the regular T cells are there. There are tons in numbers. They survive. They find a way to grow, uh, uh, probably through reductive carboxylation. Uh, they use glycolysis for ATP. Uh, but w because of the high accumulation of L2-hydroxyglutarate, uh, they just don't do what they're supposed to do, which is their suppressive function, right? So regulatory T cells' main role is to prevent uh, inflammation and infector function. So if you lose complex three, the Tregs are there, but they don't uh, suppress inflammation, and these mice develop a lethal autoimmunity and die within a few weeks after birth. And again, these Tregs, these complex three deficient Tregs, have high levels of L2-hydroxyglutarate, and they have high levels of DNA hypermethylation, which is known to be linked to uh, uh, a diminished suppressive function in Tregs. One interesting thing that caught our attention was that the enzyme that gets rid of uh, uh, L2-hydroxyglutarate is called L2-HGDH. Now, there are unfortunately humans that have mutations in that scavenger enzyme. And so these uh, uh, people are born, and, and then uh, they develop a variety of neurological disorders. It's a very, very rare mutation. They're only probably you know, a couple of hundred people in the world. Uh, but uh, you can detect L2-hydroxyglutarate, L2-AG levels in the urine plasma or CSF of these patients. Uh, they have cerebral ataxia, they have epilepsy, uh, they have a variety of neurological manifestations. There's high levels of L2-AGDH normally in the brain. So clearly there's some NADH imbalance always in the brain and making some L2-AG. But luckily we all have this enzyme that gets rid of L2-AG levels because if you don't get rid of it, if you have this mutation, then L2-AG is clearly uh, a neurotoxic. And what this uh, terrible human experiment essentially tells you uh, is these, that L2-AG is sufficient to cause uh, neurological disorders. And so uh, I, I want to just uh, pause for a second. And uh, again, I'm thankful to David and uh, the folks at Agilent for this webinar. And I think these webinars through Zoom and other technologies, I, I don't think this was Zoom, this is uh, Lab Roots. Um, you know, they're serving, um, uh, I think this is a great service in disseminating up-to-date information in a particular field. And, you know, um, as a boy, I used to live in the Himalayas. And so uh, as a kid, and I'm sure people in the Himalayas I know have a, uh, um, uh, internet service, and you could just plug in and, and watch this. And, and I know there's a move to have more and more webinars, and I think this is great. There's a sort of a democratization of, of information, and, and I love it. However, there's also a move where people think, well, is there any value of meetings? And I'm going to tell you unequivocally that small meetings are of great, great, great value. And I'll tell you, in my career, all the major things we've done have come out of my discussions at small meetings. And, and small meeting anywhere from 50, 100, 200, maybe 300 people. Uh, and so 
years ago, I was invited to London by a guy named Joe Bateman. I was born in London. I love London as a city. I just showed up there not knowing what to expect. It was a neurological meeting. Thought I'd learn a few things, check out London. And I, one of the organizers was Joe Bateman. And uh, I went and had a beer with Joe at one of their local pubs. And he was telling me about some of his ongoing research. And he had just published this really nice paper in PNS where he's got a model where he overexpresses TFAM now. By overexpressing TFAM, you get too many mitochondrial DNA expressing proteins and you get sort of a proteotoxicity specifically in the neurons of these uh, flies. So he uses the Drosophila model where you can do beautiful genetics and do quickly you can come to some uh, conclusions. And these as, uh, flies have a climbing defect. I and mean, just sitting over beer as... Um, we sketched out an interesting experiment, which was, you know, could we test the causality of L2-hydroxyglutarate uh, in his uh, neuronal-specific TFAM model, right? So he's got a quick model where he can generate flies, as, uh, which have neurodegeneration, and he can get rid of uh, L2-HG. And so what he did is uh, we hooked up with Greg McElroy in my lab, and blindly he sent us fly brains uh, which overexpressed TFAM, and Greg measured it using our metabolomics facility here. And clearly, the brains of these uh, flies have more 2-hydroxyglutarate. And then what Joe and his uh, the, the graduate students in lab did were uh, Rachel and Lucy, they overexpressed that same enzyme, L2-HGDH, right? If you overexpress that enzyme, you decrease L2-HG levels. And clearly you do. And so now the clear experiment is, is L2AG uh, necessary for that climbing defect? Clearly it is, right? So again, the, if you overexpress the enzyme, nothing bad happens. But if you take the TFAM overexpression, which clearly causes a climbing defect, you can see here in the blue, in those same flies, if you overexpress the L2HGDHD, uh, GDH, um, it's mislabeled here. Um, it decreases the L2AG levels, and now the flies can distance climb. They fly away, right? We've rescued it. And it's a beautiful, simple genetic experiment and, uh, that says that at least in flies in this one model, all the, the climbing defect, the neurological defects causing this climbing defect are due to the accumulation of L2AG. Again, we didn't fix the ATP or the ROS or anything else. We just fixed the L2AG problem, um, and we largely uh, cured the mice. We're doing a similar experiment in mice, uh, and it'll be quite exciting to see if L2AG is, a, in certain contexts, is a missing link of how uh, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction causes neurological diseases. Um, I just want to show one simple experiment we've been we've been doing in, in my, uh, uh, that we just did is. Uh, uh, while the L2-HGDH experiment is going in mice, one of the other things we've been interested in is looking at the role of complex one and its role in NAD regeneration. Again, the way we're doing it is similar to what we've done with AOX and lb -NOX. We generated a mouse where we can get rid of complex one and put back NDI1. Um, NDI1 and will regenerate NAD. Just to remind you, complex one uh, proton pumps it generates superoxide. It'll gen regenerate NAD. You can get rid of complex one and overexpress NDI1, and you only bring NAD regeneration. And, and uh, Greg McElroy in my lab was interested in the role of NAD regeneration distinct from other roles of complex one in proton production or superoxide in the brain. Colleen generated the NDI1. So this is a yeast protein. It's a single yeast protein. She made this lock, stop, locks mouse. And what uh, Greg decided to do is took a model of Lee syndrome, which is linked to complex one mutation. So this is a complex one loss of function of NDUFS4. So remember, mitochondrial complex one has 45 subunits. Uh, if you lose and UFS4, you get a hypermorph of complex one in the, and then specifically in the brain, and, uh, and they have all these uh, abnormalities. And basically, he used Nest and Cree, so sort of uh, somewhat brain specific uh, Cree, knocked out complex one function by 
uh, NDUFS4, and uh, we expressed NDI1. So we're asking whether NDI1, which is a single yeast protein, can complement the loss of a 45 subunit mammalian. And, and this just show you it works. So he can isolate cortical neurons and or astrocytes. Uh, these are cerebral neurons, actually. Um, and uh, he gives pyrocytin again using the seahorse. Uh, pyrocytin is a complex one inhibitor. Uh, OCAR levels go down with NDI1. They're completely rescued in the wild type or in the conditional knockout. Uh, and uh, we can... Um, and do the same sort of experiment in our conditional knockouts. So clearly NDI1 works as predicted, right? So complex, you knock out NDUFS4, which is a CKO here. OCAR goes down, or couple of respiration goes down. You put back NDI1, it rescues it. And this was a spectacular experiment, I thought. So these mice, uh, you know, die around day 60 or 70. Uh, and by putting back NDI1, it prolongs their lifespan. And this is quite remarkable if you think about it, because you're asking a single yeast protein to bring back uh, uh, the function of 45 subunits and make the brain and uh, work again, essentially. And I think these enzymes like AOX, LBNOX, NDI1, uh, you know, trying to do this in vivo, uh, these ancient metabolic enzymes, it can really help us dissect, you know, what are the dominant functions in different cases uh, of uh, the respiratory chain? Is it all about ATP? Is it all about NAD regeneration? Or is it about ROS, superoxide and H2O2 production or something else? So these are going to be very helpful in dissecting these functions going forward. And broadly, in the last... Uh, few minutes that I have, I want to just touch upon this sort of this general idea that we're pursuing beyond L2AG, you know, which is that if you think back about any of these neurodegenerative diseases, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, uh, you know, could the underlying uh, factor be a metabolite toxicity? Uh, you know, there's quite a bit of evidence that metabolites are toxic. I mean, there's a whole field of inborn errors of metabolism where children, are unfortunately, are born with mutations in metabolic you know, enzymes, and that leads to either an increase or a decrease of, uh, of a particular metabolite. So think of PKU uh, as an example. And so I, I borrowed this from Ralph Deverdinus' excellent review in J, JBC, where he's just highlighting here the TCA cycle enzymes, right? So any of these enzymes, whether it's alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, OGDH, or PDH, uh, if there's mutations in these enzymes, you have changes in all in particular metabolites. So PDH, lactate pyruvate, uh, OGDH, um, changes in 2-hydroxyglutarate and alpha ketoglutarate, and these leads to a variety of neurological pathology. So again, it tells you that changes in metabolites are sufficient to cause uh, neurological pathologies. In other words, metabolite toxicity is sufficient to give you neurological disorders. The question is, are they ever required for the, the many other neurological disorders such as Parkinson's, ALS, or Alzheimer's, or, or other uh, Diseases, And I think this is an idea worth thinking about because if you look in the literature, there's quite a bit of data that uh, proteotoxicity might be the trigger, all right? So you have aberrant accumulation of uh, aggregates, but eventually that might cause organelle dysfunction, right? Lysosomes, ER, mitochondrial, and, you know, all roads lead to mitochondria. And, and typically people think about uh, mitochondrial ROS or ATP, but could it be... It's, their metabolites uh, that get altered, right? It's, you know, this is not to say that ROS and ATP changes aren't important, but a third way to think about it might be to think about metabolites. Um, and what's nice is in many of these um, uh, studies, lysosomal dysfunction is a, is a hallmark of neurological dysfunction. There's a nice paper from one of our colleagues in the metabolism field, uh, Kivanj Birsoy at the Rockefeller, I just had a paper in this year uh, in molecular cell. And, uh, and what they showed is when you have lysosomal dysfunction, this leads to uh, changes in iron, which as you know, iron is important for iron sulfur clusters of electron transport chain. So we've known that lysosomal dysfunction can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, and, and, and they provided a nice mechanism here. And so what I'm trying to argue is, you know, 
irrespective of what might be driving it upstream, lysosomal dysfunction, proteotoxicity, but downstream, could it be that there's metabolic dysfunction at the mitochondrial level? Uh, and that leads to metabolite dysregulation, right? So in other words, diseases like ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ultimately might cause lysosomal dysfunction due to proteotoxicity or ER, um, dysfunction, but eventually they cause mitochondrial dysfunction. And this either causes an increase in a pathogenic metabolite, like L2-hydroxyglutarate goes and accumulates and accumulates. And we know that if L2-AG accumulates too much, uh, it'll cause neurological dysfunctions. Or one of the major roles of mitochondria is to make aspartate. And when mitochondria don't work, aspartate levels fall. So physiological metabolites like aspartate might be falling. And there could be other metabolites that are physiologically made that fall when mitochondria don't work, Eric, as well as some pathogenic metabolites that accumulate. And then these somehow, maybe through epigenetics or other gene expression changes, slowly drive this pathology. And this is sort of a broad idea now that we're focused in the lab, and we'll just see um, how far this takes us. And L2AG is one example of a pathogenic metabolite, but there could be many, many others uh, out there. The most important slide, I try to mention some of the people. Inma Martinez-Reyes had uh, recently uh, um, uh, finished the cancer story I talked about. Colleen Rezik made the NDI1 mice that Greg McElroy used to uh, uh, do the NDI1 experiments in the brain that I uh, finished the talk with. I'm uh, grateful to Joe Bateman uh, who, uh, you know, we, and Rachel and Lucy in their lab. Uh, it's been a great collaboration. Um, sort of envious that they can do experiments a little bit faster than we do in mice uh, with their uh, uh, quick Drosophila genetics, and they've really given us quite a bit of insight. And, and again, I'm uh, thankful to uh, David and Agilent and uh, LabRoos as well for uh, hosting this uh, webinar. Thank you. All right, now, uh, that was great. That was a great journey. I really appreciate that. So did the audience, uh, in fact, so much so. I'm pretty sure guarantee we won't get through all the questions. So let's go ahead and I uh, dive into them. So um, I think you ended the lecture very nicely with, I think, one of the more cogent uh, explanations of what chronic disease might be all about and how it actually goes through that cycle. And, you know, it's it's not the genes you're born with that necessarily dictates it. It may be predisposing, but I thought was really nice is that you get some kind of stress. It may be acute, but if it's a lifestyle that you continue, like nutrition uh, or, or a bad lifestyle, the smoke, whatever that is, the, because the energetic system is always in balance, it creates a new normal that goes down that slippery slope that you're describing and, and may explain why it takes many years. So really the, the question here is, um, is, is when you get these acute episodes, these proteotoxicities, these other things can affect is that at first an ATP decline or is it a redox or it's some kind of appropriate shuffling that doesn't get you to a fully efficient equilibrium where everything kind of is in balance or is it too much of a chicken and an egg that, you know, you can't really separate out what's kind of the first kind of um, chronic hit that kind of forces the system into a new equilibrium that's not nearly as healthy or let's say as uh, physiologic. Right. Um, so two, two, two quick uh, answers. The first one is thank you for uh, bringing this idea of a slow accumulation of a metabolite, right? Many diseases we know, these chronic diseases, is there's a slow uh, sort of a, a slow lag time until uh, symptoms uh, manifest themselves. And many of it's are age related, right? There's a time scale to it. And, and that's exactly why we're interested because something like L2AG is probably a normal metabolite uh, that does come during hypoxia transiently, it goes up and it has a normal function. I, I, and there's some data in Drosophila to suggest it's a developmental signal. Um, but the idea is that chronic stress we think would cause chronic elevation of NADH. And as you know, one of the things that people are thinking about is taking NAD supplements to restore that imbalance of NADH to NAD. And having that chronic NADH levels be high slowly triggers L2AG. So remember the mechanism by which L2AG is made is through these normal amylate dehydrogenase enzymes or, or lactate dehydrogenases that are taking NADH, but that's a slow occurring reaction. And then slowly as the NADH levels continue to be 
persistently high, L2AG slowly, slowly, slowly accumulates and gets to a threshold where it's pathogenic. Um, right. And so I think it's the key is um, the NADH build up slowly, and that slowly then triggers uh, 2AG for this chronic conditions that, uh, uh, that you're referring to. And you kind of led to a, a pretty popular follow-up question. Uh, uh, you, didn't, you didn't dive into it too much. Is that would, for example, supplementation of NAD externally, and, and the way this question was asked, one of them was, would that yield tumor growth instead of just LB knots, for example? But, but kind of the broader question, is external NAD going to influence this balance in any way? Right. Right. Um, we have not, in our own studies with NAD, uh, uh, NMN and our sorry, stuff more with NMN we've done. Uh, we have not necessarily observed a dramatic effect in proliferating cells with the, with the external NAD supplements. And so, where we have uh, seen, and other people have better data on this, in tissues that are post mitotic, so the brain and the muscle, the heart, where when you do give back NAD, you can start to see that ratio change, the NADH to NAD ratio being uh, restored. And, and so where I am sort of interested uh, under what conditions NAD supplements would restore the NADH, NAD imbalance and restore the L2AG levels back to normal. Uh, in proliferating cells, tumors, um, really even in T cells, we haven't seen a dramatic effect in our hands, but I think I'm very open to the possibility that in post-mitotic cells, um, giving these things work. And I think there's quite a bit of data to suggest that in the literature. Right, right. And as you can see here, I'm trying to combine as many questions as possible. Right. Let's keep going here. Um, the other one, which kind of comes back to your initial, I think, really good explanation and kind of walking through this kind of um, uh, yin and yang of uh, oxidative and uh, you know anaerobic glycolysis, and uh, so the, the straightforward question I'll just add to a little bit is that you know in your complex one knockouts there's no ATP production, so how does glycolysis respond? But I'll take it a step further: is are they completely capable of of, of uh, compensating for each other, or is there something also qualitatively differently? So even though it may appear over a certain period that there is appropriate compensation, is it really the same thing? So you may deal first, you know, complex one knockouts, kind of what happens with glycolysis, right. and then secondly, right. is it an even one-to-one -one thing, or is there something more to it? Yes, so, so one of the things that um, we've known from many of our in vitro studies is that if we knock out complex one or complex three in vitro, uh, clearly the cells can proliferate and they can proliferate at quite a, uh, at a rapid speed, uh, which, which means, you know, not as good as the wild types, which means that glycolysis is sufficient to generate enough ATP uh, for, to drive the metabolic demands. In our experiments, what was surprising was when we knocked out complex one, glycolysis clearly goes up and it, it does all of the ATP burden now. Uh, and if we put back the mito lb -nox, uh, in vivo, uh, okay. by putting back the mito lb -nox, you regenerate the NAD, but they're still purely glycolytic because the mito lb -nox doesn't contribute to ATP production, right? It, right? So now, in vivo, they grow great, right? Which means that in vivo, even, glycolytic ATP is enough to for growth, right? Got you it. don't need mitochondrial ATP, under, at least under, you know, again, I don't know how universal this is, obviously, but under these conditions, it's all glycolytic ATP driving uh, uh, the, the tumor growth, and it's really the NAD regeneration that's quite important from the ETC that's also necessary for the tumor growth. Great. Well, our time is up, my friend, uh, but I think you were able to at least address some of the, the higher level uh, questions. I really appreciate the audience. I mean, they were, were following this, and as you can tell from some of the questions, uh, we're really getting a lot of what was going on, and I think it was extremely helpful. So, Nam, thank you so much for joining uh, this event and sharing your findings with us and uh, appreciate uh, uh, you know, the audience's attention as well. So thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks a lot, David.